Good morning, Abundant Grace. This is Pastor Dennis coming to you by way of video. I know I probably look a little different. I'm using my reading glasses and I'm not at the church. I'm at my home in my little office and I thought I'd do it this way. Maybe they'll come across a little bit better. But God is good to us and he loves us and I thank God for you. I've been hearing good reports amongst you on what God is doing and I want to encourage you to keep up the good work. Um, you know, Bonnie and I were talking about his blessings in our life. And I, I believe this with all my heart. You and I, we, we, we share in the great promises of Christ. Which means, ultimately, that our time on planet Earth is very valuable. We have a lot to do. There's much to be done for the kingdom of God. There are so many people around us that still need to be invited to join the faith. There are believers that need to be taught and dis discipled. We have a great strategy and a good mission. We need to stick to the task. We need to be strong in our faith. As followers of God, we, we can't be wavering or doubting or living in fear. We got to honor the Lord. There's a lot of crazy talk that's going on in our world. I'll tell you what, more than ever, let us be enthusiastic about the work of the Lord. And I know this, that God, God will honor you. Hey, let me tell you about a couple things that uh, I want to give you links to that you can check out later. Um, uh, most of you know that I travel a lot. I'm in the car and I've used my car as sort of like my ability to be able to tune in to great materials. So I listen to preachers and teachers. I listen to podcasts from different organizations, parachurch programs, uh, you name it. And one of the ones that is right up there top in my list is the uh, uh, group of Chuck Holson's ministry. And they put together what is called Breakpoint. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? John Stone Street uh, on in um, on March 13th uh, put one together, and it was entitled C.S. Lewis and the Coronavirus. And of course, my ears picked, perked right up. What in the world would C.S. Lewis have to know about the coronavirus? You know. Um, and then uh, Stone uh, John went on to, to, to say how that it really was based on an essay that Lewis wrote uh, back at the time when the atomic bomb was first released. And so he um, went on to say that Lewis's main focus was that humanity become so consumed with the atomic bomb that we don't seem to be able to function. And uh, so Lewis says, yeah, it's true that, you know, we're, we're all going to have this appointment of death. But what are we doing in the meantime? <clears throat> are we doing the human things, the sensible things like praying, like working, like uh, reading good materials, listening to good music? spending great time with the family. Lewis said, in light of, you know, this cloud of death that seems to hang over all of us, we need to look and focus not on nature, but on biblical theism, knowing that God, our creator, um, will help us. And we can avoid all the despair that's brought on by this sentence of death. I like how Stone Street in his uh, uh, podcast, you know, he says, Lewis's words are just as relevant for today as they were seven decades ago. And um, he said, for those of us in humanity that, that have our faith in God, he said, it makes it possible for us to do the human things and to have hope. 
For those who don't have hope, <laughs> he said, no amount of toilet paper or cans of spam in our garage could possibly um, give us that sense of true safety. <clears throat> you know, and I believe this is so true. As it has always been, our God still has our world in his hands. Nothing has ever changed. Whatever will be the next chapter of this coronavirus, and we pray it'll come to an end soon, the same question remains. Will you and I trust in God? So with that thought, I, I want us in, in just a second to turn to Paul's writings to, as he writes to the church at Corinth in his uh, first letter. And we're going to turn there in a second. But I want us to pray. Can we just pray right now? Lord Jesus, as we make ready to read the scripture, I pray that you would bless this time. Let this video be encouragement to us. Help us, Lord, to be on mission. And Lord Jesus, I thank you again for what you're doing in our church family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me. Uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And what I, I sort of gave a title to this of Our Mortality slash God's Resurrection or God's Resurrection Power. And um, here in this uh, final little segment of Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul gives an absolutely incredible defense for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the importance that it has in our Christian faith. The struggles within the church at Corinth made it clear that Paul needed to repeat and have them refocus, I'll say it that way, on giving attention to the gospel. And, and maybe that's really what we need to do now more than ever is focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So at this, uh, there's these last two chapters, Paul jumps right into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if you got your Bible open, I'm going to, I'm going to read at verse number one. Let's read the first 11 verses, if you would. Now I would remind you brothers of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and which by you are being saved even as you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you believed in vain for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, but most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to the, uh, and to, then to the other, all the other apostles. apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, and though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Christians really should not be shocked when we attempt to share our faith with the people in the world and, and they absolutely deny 
wanting to listen. You know, they don't want to even listen to what we're trying to share. When, when it comes to talking about the resurrection and they just think, whoa, like that's some type of fairy tale you're trying to spread. Um, but, you know, the gospel reminds us today that, I mean, when you share your faith, it's like it's like it's an irritant. It's like it's this upsetting challenge that uh, is trying to undermine, so to speak, all the common views about death and life, you know. And the truth is, Christians are convinced that the resurrection really happened. And our Christian faith, it's not based on what one person may think or a group of people may think. It's based on Christ's experiences. He was born. He was raised. He was nailed to the cross. He died. He was buried. And he rose from the grave. And that's fact that we base our faith on, or shall I say in. The resurrection gives mankind hope for the future. Paul goes on to say in verse number 12, If Christ is proclaimed and raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Paul is arguing, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus is still in the grave. And if Jesus is still in the grave, then the apostles got it all wrong and their preaching is useless. And if Christ has not been raised, the believer's faith is also useless. So you can understand why some people would say, why believe in a dead Savior? But we know that that's not the truth. The truth is, he's alive. In just a couple weeks, whether we can convene together in the church building or not, we're going to be celebrating his resurrection. The world likes to call it Easter, but we know it's resurrection. The resurrection of Christ. Let's go on. In verse number 35, he says, But some will ask, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Notice what Paul is doing. He had already argued for the truth of the resurrection. Jesus did raise from the grave, rise from the grave. Those who might be skeptical have all kinds of crazy questions, right? You know, and so Paul asks two questions, obviously questions that had been coming to him is, well, how are the dead raised and what kind of bodies will they have? Paul says, this is sort of foolish thinking, but he answers it with uh, a very obvious object lesson in life. And um, right now it's, it's getting close to that time and people in Michigan are starting this process of turning up the soil and beginning to plant seeds. And we know that when you put the seed in the ground and you put the soil back on top of it, and there's water and the heat from the sun and all that begins to happen. All of a sudden the seed that is dead produces life. And it isn't until the plant first dies that life can come. And the seed that was put in the ground is nothing like the plant that comes to the surface of the ground. Pretty obvious, right? In verse 42, he goes on, he says, The seed that is sown, then is sown in a glorious new plant. It grows into a glorious new plant. 
It's the same way as in the resurrection. The believers in their present bodies will be different from their resurrected bodies. First, the earthly body dies and decays, but the resurrected body will never die. We know that death will come to everyone. Those in Christ, however, will have bodies that will live forever. How will that happen? Well, their physical bodies, which disappoint them and disappoint us all the time, will give way to a resurrected body that's full of glory. Their body, which is weak in so many ways, will give way to a resurrected body that's full of power. The physical body that is natural and that is human will give way, as Paul says it, to the resurrected body that is spiritual. The natural body is not suited uh, for the future world. The natural body is suited for this world. And such a body is not fit to go into the kingdom of heaven. In verse 48, he says that basically all humanity is bound up in Adam and every human being has an earthly body just like Adam had. But our earthly bodies are limited by death, by disease and weakness. However, the believer knows that we're going to be given human bodies or heavenly bodies, excuse me, heavenly bodies that will be just like Christ. Christ is the first fruit of what's going to take place in us. The imperishable, in eternal, the glorious, filled with power body is what God is going to do in us. I like how he goes on, and I want to pick up at verse 50. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, we know that we have a promise that our eternal life will be in the kingdom and that our present earthly bodies must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. I base that off of God's word, not just some human thought, you know? This is what Paul is telling us very clearly. According to verses 54 and on, he says that the ultimate enemy of the human body is death. But those who have hope in Christ, death is not the final stronghold. Those who have no hope in Christ, death is the end of everything. But for the believer, death is not the end. It's merely a doorway that leads into eternal life. I know it's a pretty big challenge to, to handle that, but if we would believe by faith, God makes it real to us. And we know it to be real because that's what happened in Christ. 
So I want to have you think for just a second longer. We have this great promise. We share it in Christ. Just as we shared our physical body because of Adam, so we share our spiritual life because of Christ. It's important that we spend our time wisely. We have to do the work that God has called us to do. As believers, we have to invite unbelievers into the faith. Other believers need us to encourage one another as we study the word of God together so that we would know God's plan for our lives. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you may have it to its full. And there's a lot of folk today that haven't any purpose. They really don't know what God has planned for their life. Paul said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, so many people are missing the life that God has intended for them because they choose to go their own way. They choose not to believe God at his word and thereby defy God. And in that way, it's literally sin. And that sin is what separates us from God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There have been so many people that have tried to make their way to God through their plans, through their means, through their own efforts. God has chosen to send his son to die on the cross for us. His death becomes our payment for sins. He was sent to die in our place. We can only come to God on his terms. Paul said it this way, if you would confess with your mouths, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone must personally respond to Jesus Christ by turning from their old life and trusting in him to give us a new life. Salvation starts and begins and continues in Christ Jesus. He is the free gift that has been given to us. If you are ready to trust Jesus with your life, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Pray this with me if you would. Dear Jesus, I've been living my life my way. And I see how that this is actually rebellion against you. And I ask you to have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you are the son of God who died in my place. I believe you are the one who has authority and power to give me a new life. I now surrender my life to you and to your purpose. Thank you for making me to be a child of God. Now give me boldness to confess to others that you are Lord of my life. I ask this in your wonderful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, if you've prayed that prayer, one of the greatest things you can do to encourage you in your walk with the Lord is to tell somebody about it.
I want to encourage you to get a hold of somebody that you know is a follower of Christ. They go to church regularly. They serve the Lord. You know them. You call me. Get a hold of somebody and let them know that you have made a decision to follow Christ. When you begin to do that, it encourages you and it begins to develop you right then and there. Another thing is to just simply talk to God. It's We call it prayer. But and some people ask me, well, how do I pray? Well, one of the best ways is to go through the Bible. And as you're reading through the Bible, you'll begin to read others who have uh, prayed. And you can model your prayers after some of the other prayers that you've seen in Scripture. And so uh, another important step is if you really want to grow in the Lord is you is you need to get to know God. And the only way you're going to get to know God is by reading his word. So you need to copy, get a copy of the Bible and begin that process of reading God's word. And then you'll learn how to be able to communicate with him. And, and another important thing that a lot of people miss is becoming involved. There's something you can do in the kingdom of God. There's something you can do in our church. Um, and the churches, if you're listening from another community, I would say the churches in your area need your help and support. Uh, become involved in a Bible-believing church uh, that will help you to grow, plus you will help others to grow as you begin to interact with people. And it gives you a level of accountability. There'll be people there that uh, you can talk to and and have a commitment with <clears throat> and vice versa. And that'll allow you then to be used because um, you got special gifts or something you could do. Uh, one thing that we need help with is people that know how to do video stuff because I surely don't know how. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, there's something for you to do in the kingdom of God. So don't don't just sit back. Get involved and see what God will do in your life. He will honor you and bless you. So now we're going to uh, transition to this one last hymn that I, I, I think is um, so uh, appropriate. And so the video will switch and we'll go back to the sanctuary and, and watch this uh, hymn. But please sing along with us. And I hope the Lord... Uh, blesses you with a wonderful day. <laughs> 